Hi everyone. Well, I asked what you wanted to hear next, so today we're looking at Inside Number 9's least popular episodes. Thanks to everyone who took part in the poll, and don't worry if you picked a different topic, as I do plan on covering them all at some point in the future. Honestly, I believe there's never been a bad episode of Inside Number 9. Personally, I've enjoyed every one of them. But some are arguably stronger than others, and whenever you see a list that ranks every episode from best to worst, you tend to find the same title sitting at the bottom. Nobody ever talks about these ones, so I've taken it upon myself to do just that. By the way, I'll only be including episodes from Series 1 to Series 4, as Series 5 wasn't finished broadcasting when I started writing this. But if you want to hear my thoughts on all the latest episodes, you can find my Series 5 review playlist linked below. For this video, I initially thought about making a list of 9 episodes, because, well, obviously. But when I looked at the results for places 9 to 6, I realised three of them had already been discussed in detail in my Most Disturbing Episodes videos. Those were The Harrowing, Seance Time, and Private View. Plus, I'm convinced the only reason we've got Elizabeth Gadge on there is because it was broadcast right after The Twelve Days of Christine, which was a tough act to follow. This leaves us with five episodes. Nana's Party, The Understudy, Empty Orchestra, and the winner is And Last Gasp. Spoilers ahead for all of the above, as we're about to look at each of them in more detail and see if we can't find some new appreciation for them. First up is Nana's Party, a family gathering where secrets are revealed, everything goes wrong, and several people end up talking to a cake. It's a comedy with elements of both farce and tragedy, and we see one character in particular dissolve into a fantastic emotional train wreck. All the while, Nana herself remains completely oblivious. So why do I think it's unpopular? It may have something to do with how the comedy is presented, at least in the first act. It does feel a bit safe and sitcom-y compared with other number nines, though I'd argue there are still some sharp one-liners in there. The sitcom style is reinforced by the middle-class suburban setting, and the casting of actors made popular through this genre, such as Claire Skinner from Outnumbered and Elsie Kelly, who had previously starred with Steve Pemberton in Benidorm. The presentation might have worked against the episode from the beginning, as fans of The League and Number 9 tend to appreciate a darker, more twisted brand of humour than traditional sitcoms typically allow. And while it still has its sordid undertones, Nana's Party doesn't quite have that devilish, jaw-dropping twist Number 9 is famous for. Plus, it's the only episode in Series 2 where nobody dies. And yes, maybe we like the misery. But look closer and you'll find the humour in Nana's party comes from some fairly dark places, often walking the fine line between comedy and tragedy. And for me, that was one of the episode's strengths. Things become a lot more intriguing when the family secrets start spilling out, and I don't just mean Jim's countdown marathons in the shed. The extramarital affair between Jim and Carol makes for some heavily charged moments between the two, which escalates as Carol gets progressively louder and drunker. For a while, it isn't quite clear if anything actually happened between them, but eventually the truth comes out, and we can see it's been raging away beneath the surface for many, many years. This style of uncomfortable domestic humour is something the number nine boys excel at. Like with Charlie and Stella, we end up feeling like the innocent bystanders who've just been given far too much information about a relationship between two people we barely even know. In other words, we the audience are Luigi. However, the gravity of the situation is offset by Carol's hysterical ramblings and Jim's desperate pleas in front of the birthday cake. As always, the acting in this episode is top-notch, but for me it was Lorraine Ashbourne who really stole the show as Auntie Carol. You can see the change in her mannerisms every time she nips off to the toilet for a bang in the old Factor 40, and she absolutely throws herself into full piss-head mode by the end of the episode. But there's more to this character than just an embarrassing relative who's had too much to drink. Through her exchanges with Jim, we really get a sense of Carol's suffering. Her lover slash brother-in-law has made many empty promises to her over the years, telling her he'd leave his wife and that they would raise a family together. It's clear that Carol is quite jealous of Angela and envious of all the nice things she has in life, including her family. Carol dotes on her niece Katie and is desperate to have a baby, and it's worth noting that her and Pat have no children of their own. Not sure if there's some kind of problem there, and that might be something Jim has taken advantage of, promising Carol the one thing her husband can't provide. 
I've also heard some fans speculate over whether Carol actually became pregnant by Jim at some point in the past, hence the remark to Katie about what her sister's name was going to be. The conflict in Nana's party arises when Carol is forced into her sister's perfect house, with the man she loves but can't have, all with nothing stronger than a cup of tea to take the edge off. And is it just me or was it a bit insensitive to put a shitload of booze in display in front of a known alcoholic? I'm not condoning what Carol does, but I completely understand why she does it. Now, I appreciate this can be a very painful subject, and some viewers might not find this funny or amusing at all. Alcoholism is no joke, and the topic may be a bit too close to home for those who've experienced this in their own family life. While some of us might enjoy the dark humour based around real pain, your mileage may vary, and that is totally understandable. I also really enjoyed Reese Shearsmith's performance as Carol's husband, Pat. He initially comes off as an insufferable joker, but is later shown to be the most sympathetic person in the whole family. He still loves his depressed alcoholic wife, even though he knows she's been unfaithful. He's very protective of Carol and is not afraid to defend her honour. The moment where he subtly reveals to Jim that he knew about the affair all along changes everything we thought we knew about his character. Pat's childish pranks and cringy jokes are just the masks he wears in order to get through the day. Plus, he's aware that his social climbing in-laws probably look down on his side of the family. But while Jim and Angela try desperately to cover the cracks in their seemingly perfect lives, Pat and Carol are at least aware of their own damage and, in many ways, have a stronger and more honest relationship. It's ironical. Another thing I love about the episode is the setup with the paramedic. Knowing he's due to arrive at some point adds intrigue and tension to the plot. On our first viewing, we don't know why he's been called out or who he's been called out for. Maybe Nana will take a turn for the worst, Carol will suffer some drunken mishap, or something horrible might happen to the poor sod hiding in the cake. It's a clever setup that manages to keep you guessing throughout. But in the end, nothing could have prepared me for the big, um, reveal. And I'll never hear the theme from Casualty in quite the same way again. Next up, we have The Understudy, which takes place inside a dressing room in a West End theatre, putting on a production of Macbeth. And yes, I'm quite comfortable saying that name out loud. I know it's meant to be bad luck, and some folks prefer to call it the Scottish play, but that feels a little bit weird to me. Shakespeare was English, and we do have plays of our own, you know. In this episode, the plot and themes of Macbeth are reflected in the action going on backstage, as Macbeth's understudy starts to go a little bit method a classic case of life imitating art. So here's the rub. The central premise of the understudy may actually be the thing that works against it. If you're unfamiliar with the plot of Macbeth, then the significance of certain details might be lost on you. However, if you do know the play, then the episode might end up feeling a tad predictable, at least until the very end. I also have to question the timescale of the events. I get that fame and fortune can change a person, but Reese's character goes from not to bastard seemingly overnight. You could also complain about the poor quality of one of the visual effects, but I'm happy to overlook it given the show's minuscule budget. After all, a few seconds of bad CGI shouldn't ruin an entire story. So what did I like about this episode? First of all, the setting. There's a certain excitement involved in going backstage and seeing a world we're not normally meant to see and I always enjoy the number nines where we get to hear from the people whose stories are seldom told, be they crisis helpline workers, football referees, or comedy double acts that didn't quite make it. Here we get the story of an understudy. It's often a thankless job, but someone has to do it. They have to audition, attend rehearsals, and learn the script, but if all goes to plan, then the audience will never see them. Their job is to wait in the wings, just in case something goes wrong. And with that in mind, you can see why Macbeth was the perfect production to use as a backdrop. After all, Macbeth is a nobleman who finds himself next in line for the throne, kind of like an understudy for the king. The play is often associated with superstition and bad luck, however, bad luck for the lead could actually mean quite good luck for the understudy, finally giving them their moment in the spotlight. And this creates an interesting parallel with the source material. Spoilers ahead for Macbeth, I guess. In the Shakespeare play, Macbeth finds himself playing host to King Duncan, right after gaining his new title and hearing a prophecy telling him he shall be king hereafter. Lady Macbeth spots an opportunity, as old man Duncan is now the only thing that stands between her husband and the crown. 
She persuades Macbeth to do the dirty on Duncan and frame the guards for his murder. Macbeth becomes the new King of Scotland, but his ascension comes at a price, as his mind is plagued with the constant fear of exposure and retaliation for what he's done. Meanwhile, Lady M becomes overwhelmed with guilt, goes insane and kills herself. It's a classic self-fulfilling prophecy that shares its moral with many a number nine. Be careful what you wish for. Backstage, we can see similar plot points being echoed among the cast. Jim and Laura, the understudies for Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, are an engaged couple planning their wedding. Jim is convinced he'll never get to stand in for Tony, the male lead, while Laura is more ambitious and believes that Jim will get his moment. He just needs to take it. Not long after joking about staging some kind of accident, Tony's drink is found to be spiked, resulting in a serious on-stage injury. Jim assumes the lead role, which kickstarts his successful acting career. However, upon his return to the theatre, he hears the tragic news of Laura's suicide. While this isn't an exact retelling of the Shakespearean tragedy, the parallels are definitely there. However, this also serves as a very clever form of misdirection. While we might have assumed that the couple's actions would somehow result in Jim's downfall, the twist is… Laura was innocent. While she might have wished for Tony to break a leg, spine or whatever, Laura herself played no part in the sabotage. Neither did Jim. The real culprit was Kirsty, a seemingly harmless dressing room assistant who's had her eyes on Jim from the very beginning. She cheerfully admits to spiking Tony, framing the company manager for sexual harassment, and even stealing Laura's engagement ring after she died. But unlike Lady Macbeth, she shows no shred of remorse for her actions. Kirsty is a really terrifying character and just the worst kind of stalker fangirl. She's been obsessively following Jim's performances and makes it clear that she is waiting in the wings for him. Wherever he goes, she'll be watching. Maybe not just Jim, but also his co-stars, family and quite possibly his new girlfriend. I can't imagine Kirsty would be too happy if things got more serious between them. Part of me even wondered if Kirsty had also played some role in Laura's death. I don't have anything to back that up, just the length she's capable of going to in order to get what she wants. Rosie Cavallero was amazing in this role, and that smile of hers really gave me the chills. And while we're talking performances, I've got to say that Steve Pemberton was an absolute riot in this episode. Tony Warner was a force of nature, combining elements of all Steve's most egregious characters from the league. I know the theatre goers were demanding refunds, but I would have gladly sat through Tony's drunk Macbeth in its entirety, especially with such zingers as, is that a dildo I see before me, and fuck me, it's a ghost. I mean, I'm sure that's what Shakespeare meant to say, really. Maybe get him on stage with Pam Dove. I think she'd be a great Lady Macbeth. One thing that seemed to bother some viewers were the visions, but personally, I was okay with them. While you could argue that psychic predictions have no place in a grounded drama, I still think they worked in context. After all, the plot of Macbeth is shaped by prophecy and witchcraft, however the drama still feels very grounded in reality. Banco's ghost, for example, is often considered to be a manifestation of Macbeth's guilt, rather than any kind of supernatural phenomena. Also, cheers Steve, this scene is now completely ruined on me. The play is very much in Jim's mind, as he's been rehearsing it for some time, which may explain why he starts imagining his own ill omens. Sure, he couldn't have predicted Laura's suicide, but he does know that happens to Lady Macbeth. As for Laura, who appears to be having her own auditory hallucinations, it's possible that she too is deep in character, or that her mental state is more fragile than it first appears. It may also be significant that she died in the shower, given that her on-stage character also developed an obsession with cleanliness. But maybe that's a bit of a stretch. To be honest, I didn't look into the visions too deeply. They provide dramatic imagery and a sense of foreboding for the audience, and so we can allow them a certain amount of theatrical license. Not everything needs to be explained in such explicit, literal terms, especially when you're dealing with Shakespeare. One interesting fact that has recently come to light about the understudy is that the creators did toy with the idea of introducing a familiar face from the world of Psychoville. Can you guess which one? Perhaps a lad with a love of amateur dramatics and bad murders. The idea was scrapped, but not forgotten, and if you've seen series 5 then you know what I'm talking about. And it wouldn't be number 9's last foray into the world of Shakespeare. The series 4 episode Zanzibar was a modern take on a Shakespearean style comedy, 
written entirely in iambic pentameter. Seriously, give it a watch if you haven't already. It's smart, it's funny, and some of the lines in it are just pure filth, so it definitely gets my seal of approval. Moving on, we have Empty Orchestra, a title that is a literal translation of the Japanese word karaoke. In this episode, booth number 9 is occupied by an office party, all in fancy dress. Each person has a story to tell, be it one of divorce, messy love triangles, or the first flush of romance, and they'll all get their turn to step up to the mic. Empty Orchestra is probably the closest Inside Number 9 will ever get to a musical episode. While these can be great when made with care and passion, some of them fail to connect with audiences, because the device is treated as little more than a gimmick. And I hate to admit it, but even some of my favourite TV shows have been guilty of doing this. We made a musical episode, because other shows are making musical episodes. Everyone's singing and dancing just because. For no good reason, or at least not one the writers could think of. Other symptoms of the half-assed musical include reluctant actors with weak vocal capabilities, a bunch of churned out and forgettable show tunes that aren't nearly as witty as the writers would like to think, or, on the flip side, shoving a flimsy plot between a bunch of disconnected pre-existing pop songs. I used to freelance as a theatre reviewer and, trust me, I've seen some shit. Thankfully, Empty Orchestra manages to avoid most of these pitfalls and takes a novel approach to the format. The characters have a very good reason to sing, they're in a karaoke booth. And it doesn't matter that the actors aren't professional singers, frankly it'd be weird if they were. They're just ordinary people blowing off steam with their co-workers after a few drinks. And while being set in a karaoke night means the episode contains no original musical numbers, that doesn't mean the songs are completely meaningless. Each one reflects the mood and personality of the character who's singing, even if the message is simply, I'm having fun, let's party. Other songs and lyrics end up revealing the character's secret or not-so-secret desires, such as Janet's crush on Dwayne, Roger wailing through the pain of his oncoming divorce, while Connie and Greg openly flirt and reference their love affair right in front of Greg's girlfriend Fran. Through music, the characters manage to express themselves in ways that might not be achieved through words alone. Everyone stays in character throughout, and their stories are all neatly wrapped up by the last song. Why don't people like this one? Well, it depends on how you feel about musicals, the choice of songs, and the constant noise. Some viewers found this distracting and off-putting, which is understandable. The episode is actually a bit self-aware in that regard, especially with the line, it's not just going to be one song after another, is it? Because, yeah, it pretty much is. Or maybe you got sick of hearing Don't You Want Me after also hearing it played at Nana's party. I guess Steve and Reese just really liked the Human League. Another reason people might not like it is because it's a light-hearted comedy with a happy ending, and no big gut-churning twists. Remember, this was Series 3, and this episode was sandwiched between The Riddle of the Sphinx and Diddle Diddle Dumpling, two highly intense and utterly brilliant dramas. Empty Orchestra kinda gets lost in the middle. Also, I think a lot of people were disappointed that the pill roulette game introduced in the beginning turned out to be a red herring. It really did seem like they were setting us up for a very different story. Would this have made a better premise? It's hard to say. But if you are after a hard-hitting play on the perils of drug abuse, I've heard great things about Bins and Needles, a play about tramps on heroin performed by the legs of Kimball Theatre Company, coming soon to a primary school near you. So what did I like about Empty Orchestra? First, and I should make this perfectly clear, I fucking love karaoke. I'll be the first one on the mic, and by the end of the night, you'll have to prize it out of my cold, dead hands. I enjoy hearing other people sing, good and bad. In fact, the right kind of bad singing can be a comedy goldmine. For me, this episode managed to capture all the atmosphere and energy you get from a good karaoke night, including your mates jumping in as backup dancers, passing the mic to a guest rapper who completely bombs it, and the all-time classic, belting out an emotionally charged number in a crowded room while blind drunk after a breakup. I also thought the setting was an interesting choice. Having all the characters in the same booth definitely got the claustrophobia of a number 9, though admittedly that booth is huge. You've also got the social awkwardness of the work night out, combined with the added embarrassment of having to sing. And that's hardly the worst thing that happens. I'd love to see that office on Monday morning. The costumes were a fun addition that added to the visual humour and character dynamics, with Connie towering over everyone in her Amy Winehouse beehive and heels, 
Well, shy Janet is dressed as boy George instead of another sexy pop diva. Shout out to Reese, who managed to spend the whole episode waddling about in a sumo suit, which was apparently meant to be Gangnam Style. The less said about that costume shop, the better. We also get some stellar performances from the entire cast, and there's a lot to love here, especially Steve's broken-hearted middle-aged rocker and Tamsin Outway as the stone-cold bitch queen Connie. I especially loved the part where her and Fran sang as Elaine Page and Barbara Dixon. No, not that one. But for me, the star of the show was Emily Howlett as Janet. The character brought a whole new perspective on miscommunication, along with a sort of twist in the fact that she could tell what everyone was saying the whole time. Well, at least it was a twist for the characters too ignorant to realise she could lip-read. Being a deaf person in real life, Emily managed to bring some brilliant touches to the part. Actions such as turning off the hearing aid and placing her hand on the speaker were her own ideas. Because yes, deaf people can and do enjoy music, even if the experience is a little different. The writers were very receptive to this and were respectful of Howlett's ideas throughout. In her own words, it was one of the best and most welcoming sets I've been on, especially in mainstream filming. I never once felt like a token deaf, which is rare and beautiful. Credit also goes to director Guillaume Morales, who's been behind so many of my favourite episodes. Showing the world from Janet's perspective helped us to understand her experience and point of view, rather than just have us feel sorry for the disabled character. This, combined with her endearing performance, really helped us root for Janet and allowed us to share in her joy when she finally got her happy ending. Speaking of which, I really did love the way the episode ended. Unlike so many number nines, we see the good guys get a win and the scoundrels getting their comeuppance. I didn't actually like that song beforehand, but seeing Fran use the chorus of Titanium to shout down her cheating partner and so-called friend might have given me a new appreciation for it. Plus Steve really captured that moment of post-breakup elation, when you realise there's a world of fun and excitement out there just waiting for you, and probably any number of eligible Whitesnake fans. And who couldn't cheer for Dwayne and Janet? That was a rare and lovely moment, perfectly executed, and left us all on a real emotional high. As someone who's also a sucker for the odd feel-good ending in Black Mirror, the climax of Empty Orchestra was a delightful surprise, and it still makes me smile every time I watch it. Our next performance features an award-winning Best Actress, well, that's the plan anyway, with the Series 4 episode And The Winner Is. And this one really seems to get a lot of dislike from the fan community. As you've already guessed, I personally enjoyed it, but let's take a look into why, for so many viewers, this episode might have fallen flat. First of all, this is, yet again, a straightforward comedy episode with no death. No misery for you. And these are often the ones that fail to strike a chord with the fans, morbid little lot that we are. Also, viewers might have found it difficult to get invested in the story, as the characters are choosing between a group of actresses that technically don't exist. Why should we care who wins? The panel certainly don't. In fact, some of them are just so outright bored by the whole process that their indifference might end up rubbing off on the audience. So, with no real horse in this race, and none of the characters in mortal peril, the stakes for this episode aren't exactly high. Another issue might be one of relatability. And The Winner Is takes place behind the scenes of a showbiz procedure many of us have never really thought about. Although I could be wrong, I've seen video essays deconstructing the Oscar bait formula, and every year we still get any number of think pieces on the winners of the Academy Awards. Incidentally, if you're a number 9 fan and you haven't seen Parasite, then do yourself a favour and check it out. But anyway, back to the episode. For many, the characters, who consist of actors and other industry types, might as well be on a different planet. While the dialogue might actually be quite typical of what happens in an awards panel, that's something the majority of us will never experience, and so it all feels a little bit alien. Even Jackie, the one character we should be able to connect with, turned out to be yet another industry player. Only this time, she's played them all. I guess she really did deserve that award. Speaking of which, I've heard many people complaining that the ending was predictable, and that they saw the twist coming a mile off. That really wasn't the case for me, and actually I thought it was pretty clever. But I'm curious, if you were one of these people, and you weren't just saying that to show off on the internet, then what exactly gave the game away? Was it her performance? Costume? Some detail you noticed in the script? 
or did you manage to identify Kelly Marston from the headshot on the board? I honestly won't be surprised if it's the latter, because I'm genuinely terrible at remembering faces. Also names. This is why I have no social life. But fair play to Phoebe Sparrow. She's an actress, playing an actress, pretending to be an ordinary person. And I bought it, even if no one else did. So while this might not be a winner for you in terms of tension and twists, and the winner is still gets a pass from me on the merits of its humour. Inside Number 9 is technically a comedy series, and this one had me laughing out loud. I especially like the embarrassing social blunders from dinosaur thespian Rupert, quite possibly my favourite character, Paula, the foul-mouthed American diva, the relentless brown nosing from Clive, quite a few shades of Ollie Plimsoll's in there, and of course, the legendary Dame Dottie and her busy hands. The phrase conflict of interest almost begins to sound like a euphemism. I also like the premise. When you stop to think about it, having a group of strangers who come together to make life-altering decisions for other people is really quite bizarre. And inevitably, some members of the panel will take it more seriously than others. However, this does often happen in real life, and the experience might even be familiar to you if you've ever done jury service. This situation can also be ripe fodder for conflict, kind of like 12 angry men with added showbiz egos. And once again, we've got ourselves a claustrophobic behind-the-scenes setup that's just perfect for any number nine. How do they keep coming up with these clever concepts? We also had a great cast, including a few Doctor Who alumni, with a nice little nod right there in the script. And of course, Zoe Wanamaker stole my heart. The characters all feel very believable, encompassing a wide range of showbiz archetypes that play off each other brilliantly. Each has their own agenda, which is made clear from the beginning, obviously apart from Jackie. Giles wants a swift but fair decision, and for everyone to remain civil. Kind of like a referee, but not a wanker. Rupert feels strongly about the craft, and wants to grant the award to the actress who best meets with his traditional ideals, i.e. no mumblers. Meanwhile, Clive just wants to flog a script for blood oranges, while Paula just wants to get the fuck out and doesn't care who knows it. That combination of flamboyance and thin-skinned bitterness from her was just fantastic. Brilliant performance. Let's give Paula an award too while we're at it. Out of the whole panel, Gordon and June do seem to be the ones most concerned about making a fair decision. However, both characters become rattled when they start to question why exactly they were chosen for this panel, or in June's case, what the value of her job actually is. As a critic, and also someone with a bad case of imposter syndrome, this really touched a nerve. Because when you write reviews for a living, it can be fun to compose a scathing takedown of a terrible piece of media. Then when it's published, you can pride yourself that those who read it might save their hard-earned cash. That and people really seem to get a kick out of reading negative reviews, so we've got some added entertainment value in there. And true, it can be validating to see other people jumping aboard the same hate train, calling out a lazy cash grab, or, on very rare occasions, when the terrible Spice Girls musical you had to sit through gets shut down after only six months. Yes, it really was that bad. But now and again, you will have to stop and ask yourself, what are you really contributing to the arts? Isn't it better to create than to destroy? Does the world really need one more poison pen or angry YouTube review? And I have to say, that's a sobering thought that's helped me keep my ego in check. I never got to June's level, and so I didn't end up with the big existential crisis she seems to be having. Instead, I just get the odd mini existential crisis from day to day. But joking aside, June's inner conflict was one I could actually relate to, and even feel slightly attacked by, but I appreciate that's not the case for most viewers. At its core, And the Winner Is works as an effective satire into the cutthroat world of media. The casual binning of the actress's headshots, accompanied by the empty words of commiseration, illustrates the hollow and often cynical realities of the entertainment world. And not just when it comes to awards. Difficult decisions have to be made at every single audition and commissioning pitch. Sometimes it pays to be ruthless, because if people weren't, nothing would ever get done. But it's easy to forget every decision has the potential to launch a career or stomp on a dream. The people who make these calls, often completely detached from the lives of those affected, are only human and might not always make the right call. For every great show or performance out there, there must be at least a dozen rejected ones. Knowing this really makes me appreciate the fact that Inside Number 9 got greenlit in the first place, and that it's been renewed again for another series. 
because sometimes in life, it's all about finding the positives. And with that in mind, we come to the most loathed episode in the number 9 universe, if such a thing exists. Last Gasp centres around the sudden death of an ageing pop star in the home of a sick child, and follows the efforts of the remaining adults to flog a unique and slightly ghoulish piece of memorabilia. We'll discuss the positives in a minute, but first, let's take a look at its flaws. First up, there's no Reese. Last Gasp is one of only two episodes that don't feature both of the writers in an acting role, the other one being the harrowing. This was back when the show was still trying to find its feet, and Pemberton and Shearsmith were honestly worried that the viewers would get tired of seeing their faces every week, and made the decision not to shoehorn themselves into every single script. While I see their point, and this would probably be the right call for any other programme, when it comes to these guys, it really ends up feeling like we're missing half the team. At the very least, it deprives us of their impeccable acting talent. Still, they learned their lesson, and from now on we can look forward to seeing both the lads at number 9 every week, even if they only stick to the smaller parts. Second, and I think this is the much bigger problem with the episode, the pacing is really uneven. Last Gasp has a strong opening with an unexpected turn, but from there on it tends to meander and sag around the middle. While it's true that the people involved would be forced to wait for the authorities in this situation, that doesn't exactly make for dynamic storytelling. And unfortunately, that's what takes up the bulk of the episode. We sit and wait along with the characters as they discuss how best to divide up the money, listen to some music, and make inquiries about the value of the item in question. While there are some squabbles and a few funny one-liners, it kind of feels like we're just padding out the runtime. Even the scene where Frankie comes back to life amounts to virtually nothing, except for a brief but jarring tonal shift that results in a murder. That bit with the pillow was grim, and I couldn't help but think that would probably show up in an autopsy. Yet, astonishingly, this unexpectedly dark twist had zero impact on the rest of the plot. Seriously, you could cut that scene out and it'd make no difference. Maybe that was the point, that they did a terrible thing for nothing in pursuit of their own greed, but it does end up creating something of an anticlimax. Speaking of which, I know many viewers were disappointed by the ending, even claiming that it made no sense. If Tamsin was only trying to screw over the adults, then her efforts have probably failed. After all, they still have a pair of balloons in their possession, complete with DNA from Frankie's fresh corpse. The only difference is they'd be auctioning off two balloons instead of three. Plus, the episode seemed to be gearing towards a far more brutal punishment, with a video camera that records when it's not supposed to, which I'm pretty sure was present at the crime scene, and a laptop that seems deliberately noted to be Tamsin's. Maybe she could have captured the footage of Frankie's murder, uploaded it to the internet, or sent the video to the relevant authorities. If she really wanted to screw them over, then that was the way to do it. But that wasn't the ending we got, which meant many viewers were left feeling somewhat… deflated. Maybe they thought the episode didn't pop, and instead it just kind of drifted away. And yeah, I think that's enough terrible balloon puns for now. So let's discuss the positives. And yes, I do have a few. First of all, pacing issues aside, I think the story itself is actually pretty novel. A has-been celebrity guest dropping dead under these circumstances could be black comedy gold thanks to the sheer absurdity of it all. Frankie Parsons died while blowing up a balloon at a children's party. Only it turns out he's not quite dead, but now everyone else wants the money and so Frankie ends up facetiming a cushion. It's just all kinds of wrong. I love watching comedies about horrible people and, truly, everyone sucks here. Everyone that is except for the kid, who really is the only decent human being in this entire setup. Speaking of which, Tamsin's mum has quite clearly hijacked her make-a-wish bid. Sorry, Wishmaker UK. We get the impression right away that her mum is the real Frankie fangirl and that Tamsin might have preferred a visit from the likes of One Direction. Our suspicions are confirmed when her mother laments that this was supposed to be my moment. As in her moment, not her daughter's. That's some god-awful parenting right there, as well as some brilliantly subtle dark humour. Funnily enough, the idea of parents exploiting their child's terminal illness to arrange their own celebrity meet and greets kind of reminded me of an early sketch from Little Britain, back before it became a cluster of worn-out catchphrases. In fact, it might even be the first idea Little Britain thought of first. Then we have the cast, which features the always fantastic Tams and Greg. 
Note that it's her who corrects everyone in pronouncing the girl's name. Nice little in-joke there. Tamsin plays Sally, a woman who helps sick children for a living, but is clearly more interested in milking the emotional aspect to further her own career. And I love the bit where she brags about meeting Jazzy Jeff in a lift. Much like her character Fran from Black Books, Sally can be a greedy, self-serving individual, but one who always manages to convince herself that she's doing the right thing or that she deserves better than what she's got. And that skewed perspective is what makes her such an enjoyably twisted character. One minute she's arguing a sick child out of her share of the money, the next she's justifying the actual murder of one of her clients as a good thing. Yeah, I'm sure that's exactly how Frankie always wanted to go. That poised and caustic smile of hers right after the anecdote about the little girl who wanted to be a postman just sums up her character perfectly. Sally is a nasty piece of work, and I thought she was played brilliantly. I've also got to applaud the level of effort that went into the episode's music. The story revolves around the death of a pop singer, and so we hear highlights from his musical career at various intervals. Now, I couldn't find much information on the music for Last Gasp, but as Christian Henson is the one credited, I'm guessing he was the one who composed and recorded Frankie Parsons' back catalogue. If so, that's quite impressive. For those who don't know, Christian has been the composer for all five series of Inside Number 9, including the live special, and he really does go above and beyond for the show. Check out his YouTube channel if that's something you're interested in. I also wondered if David Bedella, the actor who plays Frankie, also sang in the recordings. He has a background in musical theatre, and that does sound like it might be his singing voice. I'd love to be able to clarify this, so if anyone knows for certain, then please let me know. And if Frankie's music wasn't made solely for this episode, then I must congratulate the person who managed to source the ideal stock music, because it all fits perfectly. Finally, here's an unpopular opinion. I actually kind of like the ending. I thought it was a nice callback to an earlier scene where Tamsin asks her mother if Frankie's soul will go to heaven. This question comes from a young girl who sadly had to face her own mortality far too soon. That moment where she asks how many birthdays she has left nearly broke me. This is a kid who's probably had to ask a lot of difficult questions, even if she can't always rely on the answers. For her age, Tamsin's thoughts on the soul are quite profound, but her questions retain a sense of childlike innocence. I thought this was some good characterization, as well as some believable acting from Lucy Hutchinson, who it turns out was also in Psychoville. The ending sees Tamsin trying to do right by Frankie, with a symbolic gesture that finally puts an end to the chaos. As she watches peacefully while the balloon carries Frankie's soul up to heaven, the adults can do nothing but gaze on in stunned silence. They are no longer in control of the situation. And whether or not they make any profit from their little backup venture, this moment is still a win for Tamsin. And she deserves it. She was the only one who saw Frankie as a real person, not as an idol or a commodity. And even though they only met for a brief moment, Tamsin will always remember that Frankie was kind to her. She's just trying to repay that same kindness in return. In a show that can be so grim, and in an episode that's otherwise so cynical, it was nice to see it end on such a pure moment. At least, that's what I thought. So, those were the five least popular episodes of Inside Number 9, from Series 1 to Series 4. I still like them, even if no one else does, and I like to think I've made a decent case for each one. If you disagree, then that's okay, we're all entitled to our own opinions. Feel free to share yours in the comments, or let me know if there's something else you'd like me to take a look at. I really do appreciate the feedback. Honestly, you guys have been an absolute tonic over the past month, and I really enjoyed chatting with you all about Series 5. Also, thanks for sticking around till the end of the video. At the very least, I hope I've helped you to pass some time, and I hope the current situation isn't being too hard on you. Before I go, I think it's time to reveal the title of my next project. It's about a series most of you are already familiar with, and we'll be taking a deep dive into the evolutions and character arcs of its most popular residents. That's right, we're finally on the road to Royston Vasey. Join me next time for the full history of Tubbs and Edward Tat Syrup in a new series I like to call Local Histories for Local People. We'll see how that goes, but don't worry, I still have some more ideas for number 9 content, along with some new horror analysis. But, as always, let me know what you'd like to see in the future. I do read the comments, and I try to reply to as many as possible. Well, that's it from me. Please remember to like, subscribe, 
and ring that bell if you haven't already. Until next time, remember to stay safe, stay strong, and above all, stay local.